Uh, our next speaker is Ryan Field. He'll be talking about a fair data pipeline, provenance-driven data management for traceable scientific workflows. Can everyone see that? I'm not imagining it. So yeah, as um, preluded, I am Ryan Field. I will be taking you through a walkthrough, a journey, if you may, through a, a fair data pipeline. It's a provenance-driven data management for traceable scientific workflows. Flows. It's exactly what it says on the tin, I've been told. Um, so I'm presenting this, but Richard's also here. He is a professor of ecology. I, he's a professor, let's just assume that. But um, obviously, I didn't do this alone. I wish I did. You know, I don't have that kind of skill. We've, um, this is all based on, not all based, but we have our nice publication there with the list of, I think, 38 co-authors, um, three of which are in the audience there in the cool kids table, and Bob's over there. <laughs> Don't know if anyone else is here, maybe. Um, but yeah, so we didn't do it alone. It started because of COVID. Um, we started with the Scottish COVID Response Consortium. Then we kind of developed into this fair data pipeline. Um, this was part of a joint issue um, of this um, Filtrans. So there are other fair data um, publications that go along with this. Uh, everything that I'm using today is available on GitHub. It's Dockerized. If you really want to play along, you can do. There's an ARM image and an AMD image. Probably wouldn't suggest doing it right now because you'll probably kill the Wi-Fi, but if you really want to, you can do. There's the nice QR code. Um, all of our other code is open source and on GitHub at Fair Data Pipeline. So if you go to the QR code and then click Fair Data Pipeline, you should see all our lovely code perfectly written. No issues whatsoever. In fact, look, there's no issues on this branch right now. So why are we doing this? Um, well, fair, so you probably heard that a fair bit over the week, the slash one day. Um, so it's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. But we're also interested in sort of the traceability and provenance side of things. So where it came from, where your data, where you started, where you ended, how you got where you are, sort of your code run, your work workflows. It's to prevent sort of someone going, hang on, wait a minute, what did you do? How did you do it? And why did you do it? Actually, it's not really about why did you do it, but, and also validity. So it's valid, valid. you know, I made a nice recycled data image there for you all. Um, standard. Everyone's seen this. I think this was in another, um, another talk yesterday. So we're not reinventing the wheel as such. Like standards exist, things exist that can do it. So um, you've got like Git Annex, um, which you can sync files and that kind of thing. Um, you've got open source uh, version systems for machine learning as well as Git. Um, these are more specific. Uh, did I just, I'm going the wrong way. I'm touching my touchpad. Um, what was I? There we go. Uh, data Lab, this actually is more like what we're doing, but this is um, mostly in Python and it's not the same. Just take my word on that. Orderly, um, which you probably heard Professor Ferguson talk about. This is actually an R, and we want more sort of interoperability, so we have multiple languages. We have more provenance, hopefully. Um, but you can learn more about this in your own time. RO crate, so these are research objects in JSON format. This is a nice way of sort of packaging up a data product. We do actually export to RO Crate. Now we do. Um, 
I didn't know that had an animation. Uh, open provenance, so we've got prov, which is a W3C standard. We also use the prov standard when we generate our provenance, and you've got different um, different props you can have, you can prop notation or prop XML. We can do that in our pipeline. And then obviously we've got DCAT, which you probably also heard about at other talks. So it's sort of like a open metadata from W3C. Uh, yep, yeah, yeah, we are also using this. I think we're using the, this was version two. I think version three is out now, but when we started, it was version two. And it's not to say I copied the slides from however many years ago. So what is the FAIR data pipeline? So it's a magical pipeline. So, so we've got our APIs over here. So we, we wanted to support multiple languages, Java, C++, Python, Julia, and R. And these have all sort of standardized functions. So you've got your initialize, finalize, your other functions, which I will explain in more detail throughout the walkthrough. Um, you've got two data registries. You've got the, lo data regist the local data registry over here and the remote data registry here. These sync up and they both report. You've got your data repositories or your syncing, everything working nicely. Most of it goes through a, um, a YAML file, which is yet another markup language, which I will show you in my demonstration. Um, and yeah, it all syncs up and works perfectly nicely. I think that's it for my slides. Hopefully you can still see my screen. For this bit, I will sit down. I have already taken the liberty of starting the Docker container. Um, I've preloaded this with uh, a load of dependencies. Uh, we've got some nice uh, workbooks. I should do it here. We've got some nice workbooks which are numbered. You can do them in order. So the models uh, under two can be run in any order you really want to. And then three um, is a comparison model. So these are simple models, which is a Sears model example. This is a simple um, epidemiological model of COVID. And I'm gonna show you how it works, hopefully. So we are going to start and hopefully we're going to install the uh, CLI. So we have a CLI, which is command line interface. It's written in Python using click. Um, the code is on GitHub if you really wanna go for it. As you can see, I already pre-satified all the uh, requirements. I'm gonna install the local registry. We're only gonna be using the local registry for this demo because I don't really wanna push any of this to the remote and I would have to go get a token and put that in. So we're gonna do that. We're also gonna use the latest, it's a branch of the registry for RO Crate. This is a uh, development branch, so it's not quite um, prime time ready. So that's why we've got the uh, version flag there. This will take a, a second because, um, actually, the Wi-Fi is pretty fast today. This I could not pre-install because um, it runs in its own virtual environment. So just uh, give it a second just to run. It, so the regis the, both registries are a REST API written in Django, which we saw from the previous talk, which is quite nice. It, it, merges together and we can see we're now running the migrations. Ignore all this, these are just file path issues, standard, honest. Okay, now we're gonna start the registry. So um, when you run a code run, um, the registry can start automatically, but I'm gonna run it because I wanna bind it to all ports in Docker so that I can actually view the web interface. Hopefully it starts. So the registry has 
now being started. So let's just check that through the web interface. Yes, here we have a blank registry, a fair data registration and management system. It does not have anything in it. So let's put some stuff in it, shall we? We're gonna start with the Python model. So this one, I haven't preloaded anything, so I can show you how we might operate if you were starting from scratch or you wanted to run this model sort of separately without anything sort of installed. So we're gonna clone the Git repo. Uh, you do need to use Git repos because it uses uh, the commits and everything and it's traceable with Git commits as we learned from the previous talk. So that's quite nicely transitioned into this. Um, we're then gonna install it um, using because it's a Python package. Um, it is also available on PyPy. No, it's not, that's a lie. The data pipeline part of it is, the simple model is not. So then, change directory. Don't really need to explain that. Uh, so now we're gonna initialize. So this is uh, sort of the similar to, we try and stick to common terminology like Git uses, so this is gonna initialize our own kind of fair repository in this repo. We're gonna use some flags here because I don't want to input all my details, so I'm gonna use a CI flag to do that automatically for me. I'm gonna run it locally because I really don't wanna deal with the remote right now, and debug just to show you some extra information. Uh, this is a lot of information because we're running a debug. So what this is going to do is, if I can, it's going to take a nice, this nice YAML, oh, sorry, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. And my mouse is not responding. So, um, this is just initializing. Sorry, I'm a step ahead of myself. So at the moment, we're just pushing all the file types um, because it, we've, this is the first time we've sort of dealt with the, um, the local registry um, and it wants to know what file types you might want to use. Um, you can read them at your own leisure. If you run it yourself, you can go through them all. And then once we've got round all past the file types, um, I'm gonna create some, uh, we're gonna get the admin user, so the local registry, the REST API has its own admin user, and um, we're gonna get that for some linking uh, later. And it creates a directory, it's called .fair. You probably won't be able to see it if I navigate to it because it's hidden uh, by the dot on the Unix system, so I'm not gonna show you that. So now we're gonna do a pull. So we have an input, uh, a data product we wanna run um, our code with. Uh, this mouse pad is not a mouse pad. Uh, so when we pull, we've got a nice data product. We're gonna use this nice register block here so we're gonna give it a namespace. This is where it came from. These are the input parameters of our Sears model. I don't know if this mic is picking me up very good, okay. Um, so we've got the namespace. We're gonna register the namespace first because we wanna register it as where it came from and its website. And then this external object, this is the data parameters. This will be used in all of our Sears models, so hopefully, if we're lucky, we'll get a nice graph that shows all the parameters from the different model, the languages. They all, they're all the same, because uh, they use the same inputs, they have the same uh, model formulation, so they should all be the same. Um, we've got some versioning, some release dates, um, a DOI description. These are actually useful descriptions. Where the data set is stored, so it's in this repo, under static parameters as a primary resource. Um, and then, so we'll skip back to, okay. 
my notebook. This is not a great mouse pad. So now we run the poll. I have not run that yet. I'm also gonna do a debug just so you can see the nice output. I say nice, it's a bunch of text. So the CLI is gonna deal with that YAML flag. It will put in some extra bits of metadata that it might need. Um, and as you can see, it's running through everything. Uh, it's interacting with each of the, with the registry. We're registering a namespace here. Um, it will check to see if the namespaces and other fields are already in the registry, and if it is, it won't override them. It will use um, the current um, registry values. And yeah, um, so we've got um, the right block and everything. We'll deal with that in a minute. So yeah, this is just a bunch of API output. Not really too interesting. It's just sort of linking everything together on the registry. Uh, and we have completed our pool. So if we're lucky and I refresh, we should see an external object. Oh, look, there it is. I see it. So this is what we just registered. So this is going to be used by the model as input. Um, And now we want to actually run the model. We're going to run the Python model first because not just because I wrote the Python API or anything, co-wrote it. Just, it's not my favorite. It just happens to be one of the simplest. Um, so we, we can see that this is going to be our input. So the CLI would have told it it's uh, registered and it will go into a read block like the write blocks. So writes are outputs and the read block will be an input. I'm not gonna show you that. But we've got two data products that we want. We want a figure and a CSV file uh, of results. So if we briefly switch back, we're gonna run this, we'll run it in debug. We're also running local as well because we don't want it to try to connect to the remote. Uh, so let's give it a run and see if it works. Fingers crossed. So yeah, um, another bunch of debug messages. We're setting up a job. We're going to try and post the namespace, but it already exists. So we get a 409, and it returns as the current one. Standard. Um, and yeah, um, we're going to do some variable substitution if there is any. So we've got some nice um, variables you can add in but more of that can be found in the GitHub if you care to take a look. So we're gonna fill the read block. So this will be from the register block. This is what I just said. And with any luck, we should have the outputs. There we go. We have a figure and some parameters. Uh, I'm not gonna show you this figure it, because we'll show you one at the end. Let's just quickly do the C++ model. That's just changing directory. We're not gonna use the debug flag this time because we've seen it all. Don't need to see it again. No need. We're gonna, we are gonna pull, this is um, a very similar file to the one we just saw. Um, it uses exactly the same data products. So I'm not gonna show this. And then we're gonna run the C++ model, which is an executable. And we should get Two lines of output because that's all the simple model outputs. So it read the parameters and I will show you once again, it did actually run. Uh, we've also got a Java model, quite simple change. So we're just doing the same three commands, init, pull and run. Um, we don't really need to run pull every time um, because the data product's already registered, um, but just for posterity. So the Java model is gonna run. Uh, while this is running, I will show you some of the figures. So 
the REST API has a, a lovely interface. Um, so this is the front part of the inf interface. I won't show you the API just yet. Um, we can actually download the figure from the model. As you can see, this is what it should look like. Um, I'm not gonna explain the Sears model, but S-E-I-R. Um, if you want to learn more, there is a bit in our paper, I believe. Um, so the Java model thankfully ran. Uh, so we'll run the Julia model next. Once again, same three commands. This time we are doing it in a Julia, Julia kernel instead of a Python kernel because it's Julia. We don't have to. We could have run it in any kernel that will run this CLI. So once again, this will have a similar config YAML. Um, and we're gonna run the model while that runs. Uh, I will just briefly switch back to here. So when we're running um, the model, we use the run metadata um, and we're mostly interested in the script. So this is the script it will call. Um, and I will show you that momentarily um, once we've run the models. Hopefully the Julia model is still running. It does run. Oh, see, it's finished. It did run. I'm just saying it's run. I haven't checked it yet, but I just assume it works because I, I wrote it and I've tested it numerous times on my own computer. I'm joking, I tested it on multiple computers, so it should run on pretty much anything. Um, Docker does have a, a RAM hogginess in Windows, so if you run it on Windows, you might want at least eight gig of RAM. Or just don't run it on Windows. Uh, your operating system is your personal preference, or sometimes dictated by your institution, as I've heard. We're gonna run the R model. So this gives us a, a little bit, I did, did debug on this because it gives us a little nicer output because uh, when you run R code, it will actually show you what it's doing. So we're gonna load the libraries. Uh, we're gonna initialize the code run. So the uh, CLI will give you some nice environmental variables and pass it to whatever program you're running in the shell. So we've got some environmental uh, variables. We've got the configuration directory. Uh, we can derive the configuration um, YAML and script from that directory. Um, Windows uh, the default shell is batch. So we're gonna, if it's Windows, we'll use a batch. But anyway, um, we are initializing the pipeline here. We're gonna read the model. Um, we've got two functions, one for reading, which link read. This will give you the path to your local data store of the CSV file, so you don't have to worry about uh, file paths. It will automatically give you that. We're gonna do stuff with the parameters. Um, we're gonna actually run the model, plot the model, and we're gonna save the model in this write CSV function using link write. So what link write will do will give you a temporary file name in your data store, um, which you can use to save your files. And then when you run finalize, um, which is here, it will then calculate that file hash and push it to the registry, the local registry. And uh, now we're just gonna quickly run the comparison model. This is also run within the R simple model. Once again, this will do similar things. They're all very similar um, because we wanted to sort of standardize everything so they have these common functionalities. So if you run one model, you're running most of them. They're just in different languages. Um, so this is just gonna compare the models and make sure that all the models are the same. They give the same output and it's perfectly good. Um, we can see here, this one actually tells you the inputs and outputs, but we're not gonna worry about that just yet. We'll go back to the registry. So if all went well, we should have a nice figure with all of the models. 
Okay, it's, you'll, can you see that? Can you see that bit better now? You'll see here that uh, it doesn't quite look right. So if you read the paper, all the lines should match up. Uh, they don't, and that is because I updated the dependencies uh, of the Julia model, and it broke it. Uh, I'm not sure why. However, because we've got um, issues and provenance, we can go and see, did it record that it was broken? This was definitely a feature. Uh, I definitely intended this. I did not intentionally break it. Um, so if we go to this figure, uh, we'll go into the REST API. We've got a web interface for the REST API. The REST API, all these are available in the actual um, data pipeline APIs, but we're doing it for a web interface for the purpose of this talk. I don't know how well you can see this, and it's not letting me zoom in. Uh, okay. Human. Okay, so we go look at some, uh, we'll look at the data product. We'll get the provenance of that one figure for, for the first one. Um, so we're looking at this comparison figure here. If we look at the prog report, um, we get it in um, JSON, um, but we're more in, we're gonna look at an SVG. Um, we've also got provenance and XML, as I referred to earlier. Uh, we're gonna look in SVG. It's gonna be hard to see because it's very big. And there you go. I, it's, it's very big. I did not, so we start the author. Um, I can't zoom out, hang on. There we go. My zoom functions are not working on my mouse, so I will just uh, view, zoom out. Let's see if the keyboard one will work. Oh, there we go. As you can see, it's quite a large uh, prominence file. Oh, but we, we do notice some red here. So we start at the author. Um, everything's uh, in nice provenance notation. Um, we're going to zoom in, hopefully. It's not too much. We've got all the different objects. Um, if you want to know how everything works, you can look at the uh, actual schema. We do have schema di diagrams of everything. Um, so this is the Java model. We actually coded this one deliberately to pick up the issue. Honest, this one was purposeful and is in the paper. However, if we look at the Julia model, which is, just happens to be next to it, thankfully, um, it does produce different model results uh, and it raises an issue, uh, which was great because I wouldn't have known if I hadn't checked. Um, but it does work and the raise issue functionality does work. So um, we'll also uh, go back to the registry. Um, we can see problem with this provenance file is that it's not very easy to view the whole thing because it's so big. So I'm not gonna go for everything, but we've got different objects, data products, inputs, outputs, the author, the code run. Um, so everything is, oh God. Come back. Okay, let's pretend I didn't break that. There we go. So as well as a prov report, um, if we go and look at the code run, which is a code run. So when you run a, the run command, it creates a code run with inputs and outputs. Um, you've got the model config and submission script so you can see where everything came from. Uh, the code repo is optional, but we would suggest you put it in there. Um, the UUID um, is optional, but if you don't specify one, the API will generate one automatically. It's not an optional field. It just looks that way. But we can also 
look at the arrow crate. So this is um, new functionality we've just developed. I would love to say I wrote this, but I did not. This was Anthony, he's right there. Wave, Anthony. <laughs> um, so this arrow crate is a research object. Crate, it uses uh, JSON uh, notation. Um, and look, we get some JSON. Um, so this is standard RO crate stuff. So you can view everything. We've got all the configs, the inputs, the outputs. And look, we can even download it as a zip. So you could do this through our, one of our APIs or through the web interface if you wanted to export the RO crate and upload it to some RO crate storage. So we do play well with others. We're not just encouraging you just to use our pipeline. We support other standards. We get a nice zip. Um, I'm not sure which code run I used, um, which does actually have the inputs, the outputs, and all the metadata, as you would expect from an RO crate object. It worked quite well. I was unsure because it's a very new feature. Um, it hasn't even been merged with main. I realize I'm running ahead of the time. Um, I'm just, let me check my notes. I don't think, uh... oh yes, yes. Let's, um, I know what I can show you. Uh, I have a nice word document with some links. Um, let's go for the Python one. Yes. So um, from the YAML file, the YAML file, when you run, we'll call this script in Python. I use the Python one because it's very easy to understand. It's a very uh, nice linguistic language. This is very similar to the R one we saw earlier, but this just demonstrates that pretty much all the languages will do all the same things. They're very basic functionality. So you've got, uh, and initialize, um, you've got link read, link write, um, and then obviously you've got some model functions, but that's just for the simple models. That's not in the API, but if you wanna use them, I assume you can, um, they're open licensed. Um, you could reference our paper if you want to. Um, and the finalize, you can, Everything is on GitHub, so you can view all the functionality and see how everything works. Oh, there is an issue in this one. Um, I'm not sure what it is. Let's click it. Never mind. <laughs> so uh, we're not testing on every platform yet. Um, uh, actually, Bob right there raised that issue, I believe. Um, so I think, I, let me just check my notes because I'm running ahead of time, everything worked quite well. I was expecting this level of cooperation and the Eduroma actually worked. So I'm just checking if there's anything I forgot to mention. And I did do, no. Um, I believe that's everything I wanted to go over. There's uh, one extra slide. I just uh, should give some acknowledgements. Um, Maybe. Uh, obviously, I didn't work to get um, all by myself, as I said. Um, we've got uh, a bunch of different institutions we worked with, including Epic. Um, our current grant, I think, was funded by STFC. And yeah, it's just uh, thank you to everyone who contributed. I couldn't have done it alone. I wish I could. Um, thank you to our funders and to everyone who attended. Uh, any questions? Um, do you want to? So the Slido link is the same one as before, um, but if you've lost the number, it's on the program. Why are there so many different ways of publishing data workflows? Is that we're lacking a theoretical model. That, so that's from me. Okay. I'm just thinking of the, thanks. I will stand up. Yeah, so I was just thinking of the, at the beginning of the talk, you went through a list of, you know, maybe five or six different 
either date of publication or provenance tools. And it just sort of, it, I don't have enough words to write down in the, in the question, but it sort of feels like, you know, before the advent of the relational model for databases, we had hundreds of different ways of storing data. And then we had a theoretical advance, and then we had one. Is it that, or is it something else? Um, so, sort of, that is a, that's a good question. Uh, so yeah, there, there is a hundred ways of doing it. We, because we stem from COVID, we originally just wanted a way to reproducibly run sort of COVID models, trace the provenance and give it some sort of um, validity. Um, so it's not, as I say, we're not reinventing the wheel. There are these other standards. We want to play nice. It's just, we want to actually get everyone to use it. I think Richard's here as well who might be able to answer better. I was going to try to bail uh, Ryan out because it's not his fault that we're doing this. Um, uh, the, I mean, fundamentally, although there are different tools, the, the, the theoretical advances have kind of happened. Uh, I mean, the, the, you know, the, anyone looking at provenance, as far as I can tell, is using prov. Um, the data catalog is using dcat. You know, all these things are being done. And, you know, the, the export to ROCrate, I mean, ROCrate, you know, they, they merged, I mean, there may be Manchester people in the audience who were involved in making it, so I don't know that much about RO crate, but the, but research objects and data crates merged together to form RO crates as a single standard for exporting all this stuff as a common interface, a common interchange format. So, so, so a lot of this stuff has been done. It's just, do the tools exist that use all of them? Um, uh, you know, in the fair data stuff that's been put down, um, you know, we know what the standards are, but are there, um, are there tools that, that, that will allow you to, do, to record fair data in an open way and give you provenance and give you, you know, it's just basically putting all these pieces together that already exist and already have been standardized. And, and we were desperate to use something else that already existed to do this because we really, really didn't want to invent this um, because we had other things to do. But the truth is that the, 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 the moment, the specific tools to do it don't, don't exist, but the standards do. And so that's really where this came from, that, that we thought, um, that the answer was the answer was to ultimately just to build one uh, and um, and see see if if it's of interest to people because we think it's really valuable. I mean, th this all came out of. I should go back a little bit to the start of Ryan's talk. You know, a real concern that that we wanted to be able to say that when we give evidence to uh, policymakers, you know, which which you, our groups do a lot with the Scottish government, particularly. The, that we can back it up and say where it came from. Um, and, uh, and we can say, okay, well, you produce this, you know, if, if in the unlikely event that we're challenged, and that obviously, we want people to be able to say, okay, well, this graph you've produced, where did it come from? And you can just look at the file hash of that, far, of that, of, of, of the graph and just trace it back to the raw data it came from and say, well, that data is eight weeks old. Why aren't you using more up-to-date data? Um, and it allows us to, it, uh, it was, a, it was a thing that just didn't exist as far as we could tell in the world, but the standards all already did. I guess that's where I was really going with that. Thank you, Richard. I hope that answers your question. Uh, I'll come and bug you later. OK, yeah, that's fine. Longer discussions can go into the tea break. Uh, so how difficult is it to get scientists to use provenance? And uh, would this, OK, there is. It just changed. Thank you for that. Um, would it implementing it be the responsible of RSEs? I would say yes. So we do actually, we are implementing the C++ data pipeline into a, an existing model, the BEEP model, which is Bayesian estimation of some kind of parameters. Efficacy, yeah. yeah, there we go. Um, so yes, RSEs would need to implement it, but we tried to make it as simple as possible with like the minimal functionalities that they need. So it would just be a case of initializing the pipeline and using the Brinkley uh, link read and write functions with finalized. So the RSEs would probably be in charge of that, I believe. Um, 
Currently, you can write your model in a bunch of programming languages. How easy would it be to support another language? It wouldn't be that hard because we've got five languages, the code is already there, so it would just be a case of sort of converting it to another language. Or if you really don't want to um, rewrite our API in another language, you could just use the py uh, Python wrapper. So you could just um, pipe it into Python. Um, where would using the fair data pipeline be the wrong choice or at least the more difficult one than options? Okay, so this is um, a good question. So secure research environments, what are they called? Trusted research environments. We wouldn't suggest using our data pipeline as such. It would be a little bit difficult. Unfortunately, we didn't get funded on a grant to specifically make it capable because some of our data pipeline tries to get go through internet resources, like when you get your ORCID ID or Git, it would be more difficult to use it in a trusted research environment. Not impossible, we could do it, but you might want to consider other options. We, we would look into that, Richard. Open safely is the... Yeah. Well. Open safely, okay. How is this tool different than Nextflow slash common workflow language? Uh, so do you know anything about Nextflow? <laughs> common workflow language I'm competent in. Oh, well, you can talk to that. I mean, to be honest, we went through so many of these tools um, and I can't remember what the right answer is for that at the moment. And I mean, we did look at both of them, um, but, but yeah, we had about 10 people trawling through um, different tools trying to find one that would work, but I can't, I can't answer that question directly, sorry. Uh, maybe a discussion for in the break, which is in one minute. So uh, thank you again, Ryan, and our other speakers from this morning. <laughs>